afternoon, I'm Judy Simpson. Thanks for joining us for this Memorial Day edition of Across the Fence. This is a day to honor the men and women who've died serving our nation. It's a poignant day across the country, particularly when we remember the sacrifices made by our soldiers in the recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. On this program, we're going back to our country's civil war with a focus on Vermonters at the Battle of Gettysburg. That's where we find Across the Fence associate producer Keith Silva, along with Vermont Civil War historian Howard Coffin. I've been coming to Gettysburg for 40 years. One of my favorite spots is the Widow Leicester's cabin. This little home was General Meade's headquarters until the artillery fire got too hot and he had to move about a mile back. It was in this house that Meade held a council of war with all his leaders. Hancock was here, Gibbon was here, Oliver Otis Howard was here, Dan Sickles was here. The Second Vermont Brigade arrived at Gettysburg the evening of the first day's battle. The fighting was over. The Second Vermont Brigade, nine months soldiers, made up of five regiments, but only three of them reached the battlefield. Two were left behind to guard wagon trains. So George Stannard had at his command here at Gettysburg only the 13th, 14th, and 16th Vermont regiments. The Vermonters spent the night up on Cemetery Ridge, exhausted from their 120 mile march. Then they were moved down past this building to a field behind it where they spent most of the second day at Gettysburg. At four o'clock in the afternoon, all hell broke loose on the battlefield as General Longstreet with a Confederate force of 18,000 men attacks from the southern end of the battlefield up the Emmitsburg Road and the famous fighting erupts at Little Round Top, in the Peach Orchard, the Wheat Field, the Valley of Death, and then as afternoon is becoming evening, there's a last try made to break through the Union line on Cemetery Ridge just above us. The Vermonters are called into action. They march by this house and on up the backside of Cemetery Ridge into a boiling cauldron of battle and they had never seen real battle. As evening came down up here on Cemetery Ridge at the end of the second day, things were desperate for the Army of the Potomac. About 1,500 Georgians under Rand's right were trying to break through the Union line coming across the fields from my left. Winfield Scott Hancock was here when the Vermonters arrived, and he met Francis Voltaire Randall commander of the 13th Vermont. The appearance of the Vermonters had helped decide Rand's right that it was time to get out of here. But when he left, he took with them a battery of Union cannon, those cannon right there commanded by Gooley and Weir. They were being dragged off to Confederate lines, and Hancock asked Randall, can you go out there and get them for me? I can and damn quick too if you let me, was the reply and the 13th Vermont surged out into that field, overwhelmed the Confederates, and pulled those cannon back on Cemetery Ridge. As they were dragging them up here, an old soldier from another unit came along and said, what state be you fellas from? The Vermonters proudly replied in unison, we're Green Mountain Boys. The old soldier said, I thought you must have been green or you wouldn't have gone out there. All that's left of the Rogers house here along the Emmitsburg Road is the front doorstep that I'm standing on. But it stood during the Battle of Gettysburg. And on the second day in the evening, when those Vermonters were recapturing those cannons, they came under fire from Confederate marksmen in and around this house. The commander of Company A of the 13th Vermont, Captain John Lonergan, asked permission to cross the Emmitsburg Road and see if he could capture those Confederates. He got permission and on he came. Apparently when he reached this house, the Confederates just about ran out of ammunition. So with only 50 men, he surrounded the place and brought back 
we think, as many as 80 prisoners. For that, after the Civil War, John Lonergan, who lies buried in Burlington and trained his men in Battery Park, won a Medal of Honor. At the end of the day's fighting on July 2nd, Robert E. Lee reasoned that he had tried the southern end of the Union line and failed to break through, that he had tried the northern end of the Union line and failed to break through. He determined that on the third day, he would try the Union center. To make the attack, he assembled some 12,000 soldiers in the woods behind Seminary Ridge. They were told to be quiet. They were told to lie down to conceal their position. And in late morning, Lee rode along their lines. They were not allowed to cheer, but they lifted their hats to Lee and he removed his hat. And as the writer Shelby Foote said, and the sun made about his head a glory. About one o'clock, the Confederates moved more than 100 cannon forward from the trees out toward the Emmitsburg Road and opened fire on the Union positions on Cemetery Ridge. The Union cannon replied and the duel went on for two hours. And then Lee ordered his men forward, led by the fresh division of General George Pickett. They emerged from the woods in battle line a mile wide and began to march across the valley, drums beating, fife screaming, flags to the front, sun glinting off swords and rifle muskets. On they came, and as they moved on, the Union artillery opened from Little Round Top to Cemetery Hill, blasting great holes in their ranks, but they closed up and on they came the southern portion of the attack going directly toward the 2nd Vermont Brigade. The State of Virginia Memorial on Seminary Ridge, topped by the equestrian statue of Robert E. Lee, stands on the spot where Lee watched Pickett's charge. It was also on this spot where he rode forward to greet the survivors, telling the men it has all been my fault, it has all been my fault, but also telling them to reassemble for he feared a counterattack by the Union. The North Carolina Monument is by the noted sculptor Gutzon Borglum, who is most famous for his Mount Rushmore work. Borglum's statue captures better than any here at Gettysburg the going forward of the Confederates in Pickett's charge, moving off across this mile-wide valley to certain disaster. We're a mile away from the Lee statue from Seminary Ridge where Pickett's charge began. We're across the valley on Cemetery Ridge, the main Union position. The 2nd Vermont Brigade and its three regiments were placed along the main Union line at the end of the second day's fighting. That night, the 16th Vermont was sent all the way out to the middle of the valley along the Emmitsburg Road on picket duty. The 14th and 13th Vermont remained up here. At first light, the Confederates throw a few artillery shells in this direction, and one hits an ammunition wagon just behind the 14th Vermont, killing and wounding several men. Because of that, to protect his men, Stannard receives permission to move his two regiments, the 13th and 14th, 100 yards forward of the main line, down into this ravine where they will be protected. The 14th is on the left here, the 13th to the north. We're on Cemetery Ridge on the Little Knoll where Brigadier General George Stannard watched the battle. As Pickett's charge advanced across those fields, the southern end came directly at the Vermonters. The 16th Vermont, way out on the Emmitsburg Road, turned and ran and formed up behind the 13th and 14th regiments. <laughs> 
As the attack closed on the 14th Vermont, they rose to fire, and at the moment they did, the Confederates turned and began moving north, closing toward the clump of trees that was their objective. The Vermonters had a good shot at those Confederates marching by, but suddenly there was nobody in front of them. At that moment, Stannard saw the military opportunity of a lifetime, if not of a century, and he ordered his men to make a flank attack on Pickett's charge. As a precaution, he left the 14th in position, for he saw more Confederates forming out in the field. After he had given the order, change front forward on first company that sent the flank attack in motion, a rider from General Hancock came with the same order. And then Hancock arrived here. Soon after he did, he was wounded. That's why we have this monument. And later, Stannard was wounded. There was controversy after the battle about who gave the command, but Hancock relented and said it was Stannard. So Stannard orders the flank attack to be led by the 13th Regiment, then the 16th. The pivotal point was here, and here stood Private James Scully, a dry goods clerk from Burlington in civilian life. The two regiments essentially pivoted from facing in that direction to facing north in that direction. And when they got swung around, they created a line of soldiers of 900 men reaching almost to the Kadori barn. And then they opened fire on the Confederates massed toward the clump of trees and they began to move forward and fire and move forward and fire. It's believed they got off about 12 rounds and they were slaughtering the Confederates. When finally Francis Voltaire Randall of the 13th Vermont stepped in front of his men and said enough men, enough, and stopped the firing. Pickett's charge had been blasted and defeated. The Vermonters began to pick up survivors out in the fields. When Wheelock Vasey, commanding the 16th Vermont, notices a second Confederate attack coming in directly at the 14th Vermont, he forms another line of battle, wheels his men around, and launches a flank attack on that attack and defeats it as well. Now, the Battle of Gettysburg is for all intents and purposes ended, though there will be a cavalry charge later on. Here along this stone wall, just north of the famous clump of trees, the Confederates broke the Union line. How many of them poured over this wall? Perhaps three to four hundred to be met by cannon and rifle musket fire. They were driven back and defeated. But for a time along this wall, the Confederates put up a mighty fight and the issue was in doubt. But in the end, Pickett's charge was wrecked and the survivors went back across those fields. It had been a military disaster. 1,100 or more men had died in the charge. The wounded totaled perhaps 5,000. More than half of the men who started across that mile-wide valley had become casualties, many of them inflicted by the flank fire from the south of the 2nd Vermont Brigade. It's July 3rd, 1863, the most famous day in the Battle of Gettysburg. We're here at the southern end of the battlefield. Behind me is famous Big Round Top, and to the right of it is a smaller hill that doesn't look much like a hill called Bushman's Hill. In the morning of the 3rd, Judson Kilpatrick, who commanded a cavalry division, brought one of his two brigades down here 
and put them up on Bushman's Hill. In that brigade was the 18th Pennsylvania Cavalry, the 1st West Virginia Cavalry, and the 1st Vermont Cavalry. They stayed up on that hill watching the goings on to the north that included Pickett's Charge. And when the battle to most people seemed over, then Kilpatrick went into action. We're now at the foot of Bushman's Hill, a steep and very rocky eminence, not a place to be riding horses down. Behind me is a very familiar statue, the statue of Major William Wells, 1st Vermont Cavalry. There's a replica of this statue in Burlington's Battery Park. I'm sitting here along the base of Bushman's Hill, looking out at farm fields owned by a family named Slider. Judson Kilpatrick decided that he should have his men attack through those fields against the southern end of the Confederate line. But there were Texas infantry and Alabama infantry, and they rose up and fired volleys. There was brisk fighting as the Union soldiers broke through that line. But then there were more infantry to the north, and soon these attacking soldiers were under artillery fire from up around the Slider Farm and from over near the Emmitsburg Road. But Kill Cavalry Kilpatrick, that was his nickname, wasn't through by any means. He was going to roll up that Confederate line, and now he ordered Brigade Commander Elon Farnsworth to take the 1st Vermont Cavalry and try again. We're looking down on the Slider Farm from the high ground that leads up toward the Emmitsburg Road. Into the fields around the Slider Farm came riding the Vermonters under Captain Parsons and Major Wells, taking fire all the time from small arms. There was even some hand-to-hand -hand combat. And then they came under fire from artillery, artillery by the Emmitsburg Road, artillery to the north up near Devil's Den. It became hopeless, a melee, and the Vermonters decided it was time to get away. Some came riding in this direction, then going south back toward Bushman's Hill. Wells and Farnsworth headed east to the other slider field, hoping to get out that way, riding toward Little Round Top. After the wild fighting around the slider farm, the Vermonters attack began to disintegrate. Farnsworth reached the stone wall, leaped his horse over it, and as he did so, he was hit by a fusillade of Confederate bullets, and down he went. The shots came from over at the base of Round Top, and they were delivered by some tough soldiers. The men of William C. Oates, 15th Alabama, who the previous day had won fame with a valiant attempt to take Little Round Top from Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain's 20th Maine. Farnsworth was down and mortally wounded. The Confederates came over to him, saw that he was severely wounded. Elon Farnsworth was gone and the Vermonters were saddened. With the tragic end of Kilpatrick's charge and Farnsworth dead, the fighting at Gettysburg comes to an end. Three days, including the fighting west of town, Little Round Top, Big Round Top, the Peach Orchard Cemetery Ridge, it all ends here. Lee would stay in position for another day and then quietly in the night begin his retreat back to Virginia, admitting defeat, going back to fight another day, and soon the Vermont Cavalry and the other Vermont units would be in pursuit of the victorious Army of the Potomac. The Battle of Gettysburg produced more than 50,000 casualties.
the houses, the churches, all the buildings in Gettysburg seemed to be filled with them. To care for the wounded, the Union Army brought Major Henry James, an experienced surgeon, to oversee their care, and he came from Waterbury, Vermont. The dead were everywhere. The Confederates were hastily buried in mass graves, but what about the Union soldiers? They were placed in individual graves, and most of their graves were marked with rude headboards. But what to do overall? The Gettysburg people addressed the problem. They formed a committee, and they decided to create a national cemetery, and they wanted to put it on Cemetery Hill. It was approved, and the plan was made to dedicate the cemetery on the 19th of November, 1863. And to highlight the thing, they decided to invite to Gettysburg the most influential, famous orator in all of America, Edward Everett of Massachusetts, former president of Harvard and governor of the state. And then, as an afterthought, they decided it would be nice to have a few appropriate remarks from the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln's staff at the White House wanted him to come to Gettysburg by train the morning of the event, but Lincoln said no, he'd go the day before on the 18th. He wanted to be sure he got here. The rails were going to be busy with special trains going to Gettysburg. This was a big event. Why was Lincoln so eager to be here? He didn't want to miss it because he had some things he wanted to say to the country. The war was not going well. Yes, there had been a victory of sorts at Gettysburg, but Lee's army had not been destroyed. Lee was back in Virginia on the loose. Lincoln knew the war would go into the next year. There was so much fighting and bloodshed ahead. There were some things he wanted to say. So he got here at five o'clock on the afternoon before the event. He was met here by David Wills, the Gettysburg lawyer, who was the moving force behind the cemetery. And Wells escorted him just up the street to the square where Wills' house stood, where Lincoln would spend the night. The day of the great event, Lincoln came in a procession from the Wills house out to the cemetery to the speaking platform, which was located at the top of the hill, up beyond that fence. The cemetery was still under construction. There were open graves, and they were keeping the crowds out. And what a crowd there was, probably 20,000 people, including many men who had fought here. Edward Everett spoke first, and he spoke for two hours, as he was expected to do, and he gave a magnificent report on what the battle had been all about, and he was careful to mention Stannard's Vermonters. A hush came over the crowd after the long applause for Everett, and then Lincoln walked to the speaker's stand with a few small papers in his hand. He looked out across the valley where all of this had happened, and he began to speak. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we do this, but in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, 
to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. And we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. The applause for Lincoln went on and on. And then the 20,000 people went away, but really they have never stopped coming to Gettysburg, which has become the shrine of the American Civil War.